Hey, uh, imagine somebody says to you, I'm gay and I'm Christian, and I know that homosexual sex is a sin and I don't commit that sin, but I still call myself gay. In fact, I am a sexual minority within the church, and I think my gayness is kind of a gift. Anything wrong with this picture? I think there is. So let's talk about that today. Now, first, let's talk about subscriptions. I'd love to have you subscribe to the podcast if you have not yet subscribed. If you've been listening for a while, you enjoyed these messages, hey, please take a minute, hit that bell. In the comment section, let me know you subscribed. I want to thank you personally. But I want to stay in touch with you. I want to let you know about upcoming projects we have here at Cloudfire Ministries. I want to let you know what my speaking schedule is looking like. And I'd like to hear your feedback, questions you have, comments you have, criticisms you have. We'll take it all, okay? So let's let's uh, start getting in touch with each other more, okay? Please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Okay, let's talk about what I call the new gay Christian identity the new gay Christian identity. Now, this is the last part of a series I've been doing on pro-gay trends within the church, and there are pro-gay trends going on within the church. I call it Evangelic LGBTQ, three pro-gay trends within the church. The revisionist trend to revise our understanding of what the Bible says. Then the reduction trend, that is to reduce the seriousness of the issue and say it's basically a secondary matter. Now let's talk about re-identification, the gay Christian trend. Uh, that is basically a trend towards labeling people as gay Christians if they are attracted to the same sex, but they don't act on those attractions, but they still have those feelings. They then can identify themselves as a, a gay Christian or a lesbian Christian. Now, until recently, whenever you heard somebody say, I'm a gay Christian, that generally meant, ah, I'm, I'm in a relationship with someone of the same sex. I'm openly gay and I'm Christian. And I think that the Bible is perfectly okay with this. Now, something different has happened over, oh, about the past decade or so. Um, in 2016, the author Wesley Hill released a book called Washed and Waiting, Washed and Waiting. Now, uh, Mr. Hill takes the position that homosexuality is a sin. And uh, he believes that you should abstain from that sin if you are a Christian. But he describes himself as celibate, but still gay. And uh, in fact, at a speech to the leaders at the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, he said, and I quote, let me say that one more time. I want to recommend to you a move away from what we might think of as a recovery model to a vocational model. What does that mean? He's basically saying to these leaders, don't look at homosexuality as something people should recover from. If it's a sin they've been committing, they need to stop the sin, but they're still gay. I want you to start looking at that as a vocation. They may actually have a calling to live out their lives as gay, celibate, Christians. The action may be a sin, but the feelings may still be a calling. So what are we doing here with this particular movement, the re-identification movement? It takes homosexual temptations, feelings, desires, and it's moved away from resisting the sinful desires to identifying with them. Not acting on them, but identifying with them. In fact, one self-identified gay pastor named Pastor Ray Lowe, a New York City pastor, says he, quote, does not see anything wrong with his same-sex attractions. The very well-known um, apologist for the gay Christian movement, Eve Tushnet, uh, who has spoken often at conferences, she talks about her own identity as a gay Christian, and she says, quote, I really like being gay. But in terms of finding community within the church, right now my primary community within the church is pretty much other gay Christians. One of the things that I find really heartening is just how many people there are who are coming out and accepting themselves. It's almost like a non-coming out coming out. I'm coming out not as a gay person practicing the sin, but as a gay person who is not practicing the sin. Pastor Josh Gonerman also asserts this, quote, there are many things I find valuable about my experience of being gay. Gay Christians are perhaps called to otherness, a kind of attraction that is a gift to the church. Hope you heard that right. Gay Christians are perhaps called to otherness, a kind of attraction that is a gift 
to the church. That is to say, instead of the time, which was the other extreme, when someone within the church who wrestled with these desires felt very ashamed and alone, now we're swinging way in the other direction and saying, well, not only are your homosexual desires not sinful, they may indicate some sort of a calling. But here's the kicker. If we reframe the way we see homosexual desires, we're going to inevitably reframe other aspects of living with those desires. So if you call yourself a gay Christian and you recognize you can't have sexual relationships with men, what kind of relationships can you have with men? Well, that's where the re-identification movement says, oh, we don't just have friendships with guys of the same sex. We have what we call spiritual friendships, which is sort of a non-sexual way of having a very intimate same-sex relationship. So Wesley Hill, again, says, quote, just as chaste chivalry, to take just one example, can be an expression of heterosexuality, so we're suggesting that chaste friendship can be an expression of homosexuality. Chaste friendship between men can be an expression of homosexuality. Basically romanticizing a normal male-to-male -male friendship. How far can that go? Well, one gay Christian blogger who identifies with this movement said, quote, I know romance when I see it. I'm just unsure of how to define it. When Kyle, the person I'm in a spiritual friendship with, takes me out to dinner and sits in the booth beside me, it's a romantic gesture. There's special affection between us in our shared experience. I'm thankful for Kyle taking me out on dates placing his hand on my knee when I'm upset, or verbalizing compassionate affirmation without worrying that it's the made-up sin of romanticism. Now, I want to emphasize, this is somebody who identifies as a Bible-believing Christian, who identifies as gay, but recognizes homosexuality as a sin. But you see, when you identify with a sinful tendency, you are going to make some sort of concession to that tendency, as he does, or as does a couple that can be found on YouTube who represent the well-known Revoice Conference, talking about their friendship in terms of a very committed relationship. One of them has always been heterosexual. One identifies as a gay Christian. They have a spiritual friendship in which they have agreed that if the man who's always been heterosexual marries a woman, this guy will live with them and that their relationship will be permanent, something they need to work on continually. And in fact, the guy who identifies himself as a gay Christian during that podcast looks at the guy who identifies as a straight Christian and says, He's a cutie. Now, this is the fruit of identifying oneself with a sexual desire that should be crucified rather than identified with. So instead of desires to resist, these are desires to identify yourself by. And instead of healthy friendships that all men and women need, now this movement basically creates specialized relationships sort of like I don't know, celibate marriages. And then finally, within the gay re-identification movement, there's what I call gayceptionalism, gayceptionalism, where you not only see the fact that you are attracted to the same sex as being perhaps a gift, but also having some prophetic significance. So for example, the author David Bennett, who identifies himself as a gay Christian, gay celibate Christian, he says, quote, is it possible that gay people today are being sent by God like Jeremiah to find God's words for the church to eat them and make them our own? Is it possible that gender and sexual minorities who have lived lives of costly obedience are themselves a prophetic call to the church to abandon idolatrous attitudes towards the nuclear family, towards sexual pleasure? If so, then we are prophets. Now, do you see the shift that's going on here in the re-identification movement? It's a pretty critical one. It's a shift that basically says we will identify ourselves by a sinful tendency, even though we know it would be a sin to give in to that tendency. Now, in contrast, you look at the biblical approach to any sinful tendency, heterosexual or homosexual, overeating or getting drunk or punching somebody out, whatever. If we have a sinful tendency, what does scripture recommend? Three things. We confess it. We crucify it, we put it off. We confess it, this is a sinful tendency. We crucify it, I say no to that part of myself, and we put it off, we don't identify ourselves with it. If that old nature is dead, and the sinful desires of the old nature are thereby dead with it, 
then we don't name ourselves after something that is dead, nor do we adorn ourselves with a trapping of something that is dead. Think again of what Jesus said when he called Lazarus out of the tomb. He said, take those burial clothes, those grave clothes off of him because they do not become a man who is alive. So it is with identifying ourselves with our old nature. No, we identify that thing to be dead. And the trappings of it are the burial clothes that we should be putting off. Yeah, but there are plenty of very prominent leaders who are saying those clothing, the, the, those sets of clothes, they should be worn. One of the most popular and well-known of them would be Dr. Preston Sprinkle. He is widely read. He's extremely popular. He's an awfully good speaker. I mean, uh, you, you can say a lot of good things about the man. He's very articulate. He presents very, very well. And much of what he presents is very, very good. But much of what he presents is also very, very problematic. He endorses and participates in a conference called Revoice, which is basically the cornerstone of the re-identification movement. He presents himself as orthodox, and in many ways, Dr. Sprinkle is orthodox. So let's be fair about this. But his latest book on transgenderism is dedicated to his transgender friend, who is called Leslie. Leslie is a male to female transgender who identifies himself as they and who also identifies himself as, quote, gender queer and gospel centered. It is this person, a self identifying transgender, biological male living as a female, going by the name Leslie, referring to himself as they and gender queer. It is that person who Dr. Sprinkle calls, quote, a mentor, a friend, and a faithful servant of Christ and humanity, and his book is dedicated to Leslie. Now, hey, anybody who has said no to a serious sin and is trying to walk away from that sin and walk in truth, hey, I'm all over that. I say, wow, I dedicate my, my best wishes to you, my praise, my affirmation. Sure, this is another matter. This is somebody who is, in essence, saying, God made a mistake when he created me male. I adopt a transgender identity. I refer to myself in the plural, but hey, I'm still a Christian. I'm just a gender queer Christian. And Dr. Sprinkle not only is okay with that, he actually commends that person by dedicating his book to that individual. Dr. Mark Yarhouse, also very well known and widely respected among evangelicals, and again, has a lot of good things to say over the years. I've appreciated his work, but one of his latest books is called, quote, Costly Obedience, What We Can Learn from the Celibate Gay Christian Community. Okay, why am I going off on all this? Are these a bunch of terrible people who should, we should, uh, you know, write off? No. I mean, hey, I... <laughs> I appreciate their heart. I appreciate their attitude. When I repented of homosexuality, believe me, I came into the church a mess. I was vulnerable. I was frightened. I needed a lot of affirmation, reassurance, discipling, exhortation, all the things that any repentant person needs. What I didn't need was for somebody to tell me that I should identify myself with the very tendency I had repented of. In fact, let me take it a step further. The night I repented, God made it very clear to me, you are never again, never again to refer to yourself as a gay man. If you've got homosexual temptations, admit it. Don't pretend they're not there. But you don't identify yourself by those temptations anymore. So yeah, I appreciate these guys for a lot of reasons, but they're also seriously wrong for three reasons. One, they encourage identification with a sinful tendency. Nothing in scripture encourages us to identify ourselves with a sinful tendency, just the opposite. Our identification is in Christ and in his righteousness. We do not identify ourselves by a sinful tendency. Secondly, these men neutralize a sinful tendency with words like gay or minority. A sinful tendency should be described as a sinful tendency, not something positive. Gay is a positive term. Minority is a legitimate, dignified term. Those are not terms you should use for something which is inherently sinful. And third, these men advocate what I call a needless separation of one group within the body of Christ from the rest of the body of Christ. When you start basically separating yourself by saying, I'm a sexual minority, I have a very distinct calling, I'm very different than other people. Well, this is another way of doing exactly what Paul told the Corinthian church they shouldn't do. He said, is Christ divided? Come on. You should not be set up with all these labels and factions and ways of distinguishing yourselves from each other. 
It's a needless separation. And in my opinion, it's a separation which encourages a victim-based mentality. Well, I kind of string along in contrast to that with one of the writings I saw from a young um, woman who was a former lesbian. And she was very honest about her journey when she said this about the whole idea of a gay identity. She said, quote, I found for myself that moving past gay identity was essential for living stably and contentedly according to my beliefs as a same-sex attracted Christian woman. Abandoning gay identity doesn't mean being in denial. It doesn't mean naming it and claiming it, proclaiming that you're healed, that you're totally straight and happily heterosexual if you're still homosexuality attracted or homosexually attracted, I should say. What it means is radically altering the role that the fact of your homosexual attractions plays in your thinking about yourself and your life. Whoa, did she nail that? It means it's radically altering the role that the fact of your homosexual attractions plays in your thinking about yourself and in your life. Wow, did I find that to be true as well? I did. The less I identified myself with those tendencies, the less they not only defined me, but the less power they had in my life. This is one of the reasons I'm sure Paul said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We are now going from have no fellowship to have no boundaries. That is exactly why we cannot make peace with the re-identification movement. I've really enjoyed talking to you about these three trends. I don't enjoy thinking about them. I think they're very serious. I think they're a subject that we should all be concerned about, but I appreciate the the chance to share my heart with you on this. Now, a couple of things. Number one, I would love to send you an ebook where I clarify a lot of the rebuttals we can make to the pro-gay theology and to pro-gay claims of people who identify as gay and Christian. So if you'll just email me, go to joe at joedallas.com. Tell me you want that free ebook. I would love to send it to you. And again, if you haven't yet subscribed, hit the bell, subscribe. Love to have you be a part of this community. Also, uh, I'd love to have you partner with me in this ministry. Cloudfire Ministries, we uh, produce these podcasts every week. We do it, of course, free of charge, but we do need your help in this. So if you'd like to support this work, go to joedallas.com slash giving, joedallas.com slash giving. That'll show you how you can send us your tax deductible gift, and uh, we'll be glad to have you as a partner and an ally in this work. Okay, well, we're Christians in a cancel culture, and uh, this podcast is here every Friday. Thank you for being here. Hey, I'll look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.